Welcome to a guided conversation about Wallingford, Connecticut native son, Moses Yale Beach, whose contributions to the world are mostly unsung. Today we are speaking with Valerie Comor, Director of Corporate Archives at the Associated Press, and Professors of American History Menachem Blondheim, joining us from Israel, and Robert E. May, joining from Washington State. To provide our viewers with some context, Moses Yale Beach was born in Wallingford, Connecticut on January 15, 1800 and died in 1868. A man of many skills and innovations, his most successful venture involved the penny newspaper The Sun from 1838 to 1858. He died approximately three years after Lincoln was assassinated while living in his mansion built by architect Henry Austin. In 1838, Beach assumed complete ownership of The Sun by buying out founder and brother-in-law Benjamin H. Day's interest. Under Beach's guidance, The Sun became arguably the most successful daily newspaper in the United States. Beach readily kept in step with the changing technological contexts and ensured The Sun always adjusted and increased its readership and circulations. From employment of steamships, boats, horse express to carrier pigeon, Beach was a man of great faith in all forms of progress pioneering the employ of steamships and railroads in the collection of news. But it was the work of a neighbor living only a block from the Sun's New York office which inspired in Beach a legitimate wonder. Developed in the 1830s and 1840s by Samuel Morse and other inventors, the telegraph revolutionized long-distance communication. It worked by transmitting electrical signals over a wire laid between stations. In addition to helping invent the telegraph, Samuel Morse developed a code bearing his name that assigned a set of dots and dashes to each letter of the English alphabet and allowed for the simple transmission of complex messages across telegraph lines. Beach was a vocal advocate for the importance of the telegraph. He not only supported the building of necessary infrastructure, but he insisted that there should be no monopoly use of the telegraph by anyone, including the sun. He truly believed that inventions which brought the world closer together must remain open to all. This ideology came to the fore in the context of the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848 when Beach adopted an approach that brought rival newspapers together including his chief competitors. Beach, being a man of both charisma and common sense, realized that each newspaper acting only for itself was needlessly wasting great sums of money. He believed there was a solution to be found and, toward the close of the Mexican-American War, held a meeting in his office at the Sun to discuss steps that could be taken to lessen the waste of money, workforce and time. Thus, the Sun, the Herald, the Tribune, the Express and the Journal of Commerce founded the New York Associated Press, designed to cooperate in gathering news. The New York Associated Press has now become a world-embracing establishment for the collection of news of every description which it furnishes to its members of New York City, as well as the newspapers in every part of the country. Today, the Associate Press carries Beach's enterprising spirit forward into tomorrow as they describe their mission, and I quote, For 170 years, we have been breaking news and covering the world's biggest stories, always committed to the highest standards of objective, accurate journalism. We were founded as an independent news cooperative, and remain owned by our U.S. newspaper and broadcast members, steadfast in our mission to inform the world. From delivering the news via Pony Express in 1846, to working in virtual reality today, we are always innovating." End quote. After the formation of the Associated Press and the end of the Mexican-American War, 
Moses Y. Beach decided it was time to pass his business into the ready hands of his sons and return home. He was only 58 years old at the time. We will reveal some of our discoveries about Moses Yale Beach and attempt to put his contributions into context for both his time and ours. Our distinguished guests are experts in their respective fields and their contributions remain, increasingly so, relevant to our contemporary education regarding important events in history not always in the larger public awareness. This is but one reason why we are happy and honored today to be joined by the Director Como and Professors Blondheim and May. Professor Robert May, formerly of Purdue University and now retired, is a specialist in 19th century American history and the author of, among others, Manifest Destiny's Underworld, The Southern Dream of a Caribbean Empire, Slavery, Race and Conquest in the Tropics, Lincoln Douglas and the Future of Latin America, and Ulatide in Dixie, Slavery, Christmas and Public Memory. His works contribute renewed understandings of and interventions to knowledge about 19th century American Western expansion. In doing so, Professor May's work alters and enhances our understandings of manifest destiny, underground railroads, and other important focus topics affixed to the antebellum and beyond, and Professor May's recent writing continues to explore the necessity of intervention in nationwide education curriculums. Professor Menachem Blondheim is a faculty member in the Department of Communication and Journalism and the Department of History in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His research explores the role of communication in American and in Jewish history, as well as the history of media. A former entrepreneur and executive in the high-tech industry in the dawn of high-speed digital communications, he also studies the development, performance, and meaning of communication technologies, new and old. He has received his BA degree from the Hebrew University, MA and PH degrees from Harvard University, and has won fellowships from the NEH, Smithsonian Institution, Library of Congress, and the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Blondheim's extensive work in communication and communication histories is, for our purposes, fascinatingly presented in his book, News Over the Wires, The Telegraph and the Flow of Public Information in America, 1844 to 1897. Director Valerie Comor is the founding director of the Associated Press Corporate Archives. Before joining AP in 2003, she held positions at the Oberlin College Archives, the Rockefeller Archives Center, the Smithsonian Institution Archives of American Art, and the New York Historical Society. She holds an MA in Medieval Studies from Yale University and an MLIS from the University of Texas at Austin. In 2003, AP President, Vice President and Director of Corporate Communications, Kelly Tunney, asked Director Coma to establish AP's first corporate archives. According to Director Coma, this offer was a great challenge, as it involved creating a new department and promoting a new idea within the company, the systematic documentation of AP itself. Finally, I am Rian Oppelt, an English and Cultural Studies scholar at Stellenbosch University, South Africa. I am interested in the absorbing global histories of media and communication as I pay attention to our contemporary media cycles and usages. Our three guests and their work, you may have noticed, have ties to the subject of our discussion today, namely Moses Yale Beach, a name largely still unrecognized in the public imaginary. Let us begin with how our panelists first encountered Mr. Beach. If I may start with Director Komar, what was your first encounter? with Moses Yale Beach? My first encounter with Moses Yale Beach was actually an encounter with his great-great-grandson, uh, Brewster Yale Beach. Uh, and that took place shortly after I arrived at AP, probably in 2004. And Kelly Tunney, um, then, as you mentioned, head of uh, corporate communications, had already met um, Brewster Yale Beach, um, who was really a very interesting man in his own right, but um, specifically uh, of interest to AP, held a collection of personal papers that he claimed documented the 
founding of the AP by his great-great-grandfather, Moses Yale Beach. And so as he lived uh, a couple hours north of New York, uh, we drove up to meet him and his wife um, and spent um, an afternoon looking over the papers, which um, he did bring up out of his basement uh, storage area. And we talked about them. And that was really the first time I had ever encountered the name of Moses Yale Beach. And we were, Kelly and I were very, very intrigued. Um, and I thought it was very important to understand exactly what his contribution to the founding of the Associated Press was. So that afternoon we developed uh, the beginnings of a friendship and uh, eventually uh, Brewster uh, Yale Beach um, came down to visit the AP and ultimately uh, we arranged for him to donate those papers to the corporate archives. Thank you very much, Director Comer. If I may shift the same question now to Professor Blondheim. Okay, let me start from the end. My last encounter with the beaches, Moses Ye Moses Yale, the father, Moses Ferry, the son. Uh, as it turns out, uh, there was a competitor to Tom to uh, Mark Twain in writing *The Innocents Abroad*. Uh, Moses Beach visited the Holy Land in the same excursion with uh, Mark Twain and wrote his own memoir, which I started digging into living in Jerusalem, as I do. Uh, and I discovered more and more on uh, the Beach family affairs uh, at the New York Historical Society, where Valerie, uh, of course, knows very well. And it was it's a fa fabulous project, which connected me back to actually my work as a doctoral student. Uh, that's where I encountered when and how I encountered Beach for the first time. Uh, I was looking into the uh, impact of the telegraph, and after a very short while, I discovered that as a co common carrier, we simply don't have records that would enable to construct a social history of uh, the American telegraph and telegraphy generally. The one place where we do have records is the use of the telegraph for news reporting, because the telegraphic news reports are recorded in newspapers. Uh, so I started looking at newspapers carrying telegraphic news and discovered that actually the telegraph was only a final step in accelerating news, uh, a process that took place in America uh, throughout, but most markedly with the transportation revolution towards the second quarter and in the second quarter of the 19th century. Uh, and when you start thinking of speed, of communication, of transmission, uh, 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 Moses Yale Beach just caught my imagination because the person uh, was involved in rapid transportation and using steam. He was a, a mechanical genius, I would assume. I assume. Uh, he was interested uh, and involved as an entrepreneur. I mean, he's a Yankee Connecticut, right? So when he's interested in something, he turns it into an er enterprise. Uh, so uh, he, he, he speed uh, through using steam for transportation, then creating pa cheapening paper by creating new techniques and technologies for producing paper using a, a wood pulp for the first time. Uh, and, and of course, when you look at these technologies, it, it's, it's immediately associated to the newspaper, to the spreading of news. And telegraphy would be just a natural addition when it comes along as, uh, as per your Riyad, uh, for your introduction. Thank you very much, Professor Blondi, and also for just uh, raising a point. I'm sure we will we will find is a recurring one, and that is the point of speed, uh, the speed of modernity. I think that is a uh, that is one we can put a pin in and probably come back to very very soon. Uh, and if I may, finally, uh, Professor May, uh, your first encounter with Moses Yale Beach. Well, my, my reflections uh, bridge both of those uh, responses. Uh, in, the, in the one sense, it was academic uh, in, in, the, in a book. I was in grad school. I got very excited about American territorial expansion and uh, particularly the philosophy of manifest destiny. And where do you start? Well, you need a background. And there were only a couple of books at that point that had really been written about manifest destiny. And 
And the better one, I think, was by a historian, uh, a Harvard historian by the name of Frederick Merck. And uh, he wrote Manifest Destiny and Mission in American History. And, and uh, Beach shows up in, in three spots, as I remember it. Uh, he shows up as a key member of the coterie of New York penny newspapers uh, who um, uh, disseminated expansionist news to the masses, uh, mostly out of New York City, but other East Coast cities uh, like Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Boston. And um, so that was one place. And then uh, he went on this uh, really surprising mission to Mexico as a State Department secret agent in the U.S.-Mexican War. And that was fascinating. And then I think there was a footnote, if I remember right, to uh, Beach's involvement in uh, Cuban uh, uh, projects uh, to add Cuba to the United States when it was a Spanish colony in, in the uh, 1840s and 1850s. So um, that was the beginning. And then uh, I hit the archival uh, end of it uh, much later on. So it was really a two-step process. I, uh, I, was, I, I, I was in the National Archives one day researching a totally different topic and stumbled upon a, a woman's letters by the name of Jane Casnow. I'd, I'd never heard of her. And uh, she went by a different uh, name when she was closest uh, with um, Moses Yale Beach. Uh, she would be uh, Jane McManus Storm. But at any rate, uh, mm -hmm. I ran into this woman and she went along with Moses Yale Beach on the mission to Mexico. And so uh, I started studying her and I, I wound up uh, writing three articles about her just because uh, I found uh, the whole idea that women at a time of the supposed cult of domesticity, when women were supposed to stay in the home, raise children and uh, go to church, uh, I found it just fascinating that, that she would be on a secret mission to Mexico. And I wound up writing three articles about her. There's now a biography uh, about her by the historian Linda, Linda Hudson. And, um, uh, and, and when I was doing the research on her, I, of course, gravitated to the New York Historical Society and saw the Brewster Yale Beach uh, collection. I believe they were copies at the time that was then uh, there were copies in the New York Historical Society that I was able to use, and um, they contributed a lot to my writing about uh, Jane Kasner. So that's, that's my story. Thank you very much, Professor May. And uh, for our viewers, for some added context, Professor May just dropped some very tantalizing touch points there uh, in terms of uh, Jane Kasner, uh, connection to, to Moses Beach, and also just the... the the word spy, it always generates some kind of excitement. And on this, I would like to add that Professor May and I, as well as Director Como and I, will be having follow-up conversations because the Moses Yale Beach discussion clearly has some spreading roots that we are going to follow and trace. Um, Professor May, while I still have you, uh, now more focused uh, question for you, tying to your expertise. And uh, this is... Regarding a glimpse into Beach's life, well, this can provide a unique lens into the values and cultures of antebellum America, which is rich and parallel to today uh, from the 1830 great cholera pandemic and our public health response to the COVID pandemic. The opportunities to be self-made, uh, the awakening of industry, a financial crisis tied to decentralizing banks, the rise of a wealth class, and the idea of manifest destiny. Could you kindly provide us with a snapshot of the America the young Mr. Beach was experiencing? I think very much Moses Yale Beach uh, reflects trends and developments in America at the time. Uh, and, and you could make a case that he's highly representative of them in, in so many different ways. Americans in the 1830s, 1840s, and, and maybe closer to the Civil War uh, be, before a you know, the, the, the slavery question uh, consumed the country. Um, uh, Americans thought of themselves as, as a go-ahead people, that there was something special about them, their, their uh, sense of enterprise, initiative, and so on. And we can debate forever why Americans felt this way and wh whether or not uh, they had these kinds of unique 
characteristics can be which can be seen as very ethnocentric. But but the fact is that America was founded by a uh, an, a nation of, of, of white immigrants, uh, of course, indigenous peoples were already here. And those white immigrants were, were, for some reason, willing to take the gamble of traveling across the Atlantic Ocean, a time when travel was uh, very long and, and, and very dangerous, and come to uh, an American continent and uh, start developing what became a, a a nation after the American Revolution. And the immigration persisted right up to the Civil War, right through uh, Moses Yale Beach's time, uh, the 1850s, especially after the potato famines of 1848 and the failed revolutions in Europe uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, there were just um, multitudes of people flocking into the United States. Uh, so that was, that, that was one thing. Uh, we were an expanding nation at the time. Most people think of us ex as expanding westward, but we were expanding in other directions too. For one thing, we were growing from village to city. Uh, people were leaving their established uh, lives in their villages with their churches and their uh, extended families and, uh, and, and moving and, and giving up their farms and, and, and moving into cities like New York City. And the amount of growth in New York City, which of course became Moses Yale Beach's base, was staggering. Uh, it grew to about 25,000 people per square mile, uh, which was a huge amount back in, in uh, 1835 or so. And um, it, it, uh, it, it grew from a population in just the tens of thousands up to uh, many, many uh, about a quarter million people uh, before long. And, and so uh, they're flocking into the cities. They're spreading westward. Uh, the cities are developing commercial uh, links with uh, all parts of the world, including uh, uh, Asia, but, but also especially uh, the Caribbean. And uh, Cuba was one of New York cities. New York City became the commercial hub of the country. And Cuba became a very important part of New York's trade. Uh, overall, in the United States, Cuba was America's third most important trading partner. And uh, there were more Cubans in New York City by the time of the Civil War than all the other Latin American countries put together. Uh, some of them were just coming for their education. Some of them were there for business reasons. It was an immense trade. Uh, ships were leaving New York all the time with barrels and nails and flour and all sorts of uh, American produce and bringing back, uh, of course, things like sugar and coffee and uh, uh, other products, uh, molasses and things like that from uh, from Cuba. And and so uh, you have this, you have Moses Beach, he's in a city which is booming in population. He comes from an area where technology reigns supreme. If you look at the great inventors of American history and, and our inventor, inventions were respected all over the, the world uh, the, uh, uh, at the uh, Crystal Palace exhibition in 1851 in London, uh, they raved over things like the Colt Revolver and the McCormick Reaper and so on. But virtually every one of the, the key inventors of the period, except McCormick, uh, who was born in Virginia, Virtually all the others, whether you're talking about John Deere, who invented the steel plow, or Samuel Colt, who invented not only the revolving chamber on the, on the, on the uh, revolver, but also the whole principle of interchangeable parts, uh, and Elias Howe, who invented the sewing machine. I could go on and on, but uh, almost every one of them is from New England. Well, New England was settled by uh, the Puritans, especially as we know, the Puritans put in the first public education system in America. American education was just uh, uh, exploding public education so that about 90% of the population would be literate by the time of the Civil War. Um, I think uh, the, the literate population in uh, England, as I remember it, and I'd have to look up these statistics, but I think it was around 40%. Um, it, it, it's, it's no wonder. So Beach comes from an area where people are very inventive, very enterprising. He moves to a city, which is the commercial 
hub of the Atlantic world. And uh, he moves uh, at a time when the country is expanding greatly in territory. Is it any wonder he becomes an exponent of uh, manifest destiny and American expansion? And uh, there are just countless other ways, I think, you could make the case that, uh, that Moses Beach uh, reflects uh, his time. But we have to remember, we, are, we become a continental nation during his lifetime. When, we, when he's born, uh, the country's uh, just in, uh, you know, it's, it's basically at the Appalachian Mountains and then goes uh, in the revolution, it goes out to the uh, Mississippi River. But then it goes all the way across the continent, which leads us to start viewing trade and possibly even possessions. We're already interested in acquiring Hawaii uh, by the uh, 1850s. There's some initial uh, diplomacy about that. And so, um, and, and Alaska too, for that matter. So uh, you're, uh, it's no wonder that Moses Yale Beach became the kind of man he was. Thank you very much, Professor May. Uh, some extraordinary insights there, and again, a few uh, flashpoints to anticipate in, in a follow-up conversation, particularly your thoughts on geographical direction as, uh, as linked to, uh, to the expansion. That's not necessarily strictly the Western expansion. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Blondheim, uh, to turn to you and to, to come back to, to the notion of speed, which somewhat uh, finds itself in the undercurrent of this question. Uh, innovation included the birth of communications. And for those of us carrying a phone in our pocket, how are our communication experiences today rooted in the emergence of the telegraph and the penny paper? I think when it comes to the penny paper, it is more experiential uh, speaking about the telegraph, I think it's more conceptual uh, and maybe ideological in the sense that uh, from times immemorial until the telegraph, communication and transportation were the same thing in effect. To get information, you needed some carrier to bring that information uh, from a distance to, to yourself, to where you were. The telegraph created the separation of uh, transportation from knowledge, from information. Uh, and that is probably the most significant change in communications uh, since perhaps uh, the printing press or uh, maybe even greater than that. Uh, once we didn't have the concept of communication until the telegraph appeared or quite a few years after it appeared, uh, the, the editor, uh, competing editor in New York said that the telegraph creates a whole new class of ideas, I'm quoting, a new species of consciousness. Mm. Uh, the, fact, it, 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 the fact that these religious notions of omnipresence, of being at two places at the same time, uh, of uh, things happening in all kinds of places, uh, as if guided from some unique, different, alter existence, it, that all begins with the telegraph. So this is, in, in a deep sense, the telegraph really changes the way we think of the world and the way we think of information. Uh, the main aspect of the telegraph, uh, though it, it's paradoxical, you don't see anything moving, you don't get the sense of speed at all from the telegraph, but the telegraph comes to a nation uh, in which speed was being revolutionized just shortly before uh, the appearance of the telegraph. Uh, river navigation uh, speeded up 500% in uh, the two decades before the telegraph. Uh, it, it, were, it was three months to get from uh, New Orleans to Chicago. Uh, once Chicago was established, uh, with the tel with uh, with steam, these times were shortened by hundreds of percent. And uh, with a telegraph overnight, uh, distances just no longer existed when it came to information. But the way a person got that notion, got that feeling was through reading his newspaper. In fact, it wasn't necessarily reading the newspaper. And one 
Perhaps the, re the, the most significant aspect of the penny press revolution that began with the sun appearing in uh, 1833 uh, was the fact that news, information, uh, events that are happening and concern everyone took place, were suddenly appeared in the public sphere. If previously you read your newspaper, the news came to your doorstep with the delivery of a, of a newspaper you subscribed to, with the penny press and the, the marketing revolution of street sales, uh, information became part of uh, the rough and tumble of every day. You heard uh, what New Yorkers considered the news crying nuisance. The newspaper uh, uh, vendors screened the, the headlines in the street to entice people to buy the newspaper. Uh, the fact that the, the, the newspaper could be sold not by subscription, by, but by the unit, forced editors to, to constantly bring new information. So if at the beginning people like Moses Yale Beach, who wasn't very, or Benjamin Day, in fact, but later Beach too, uh, they realized people were thrilled by new information about the world, about things they didn't know previously. Uh, so they started collecting local news, which wasn't really previously newspaper material. They went to courts, they went to hospitals, uh, they went to the fire department to hear where there were fires, they went to, to the courts to hear new proceedings of trials that caught the people's fancy. Uh, they brought a news just by walking around town. These people weren't well connected. The news didn't come from the outside in, from networks of financial experts or networks of politicians. They picked up the news from strolling through town that, uh, uh, as uh, Professor May explained, where towns were and cities were growing uh, constantly, there was more happening. And people were curious about this kind of information. And the fact that you had news in the public sphere, it caught. Now, when you have a newspaper sold on the streets, you could publish a number of editions a day. By subscription, it's one edition in the morning, you get a piece of news, okay, it waits 24 hours, uh, until it gets published. But if you can sell in the streets, uh, you, you, any new bit of information can immediately be printed, published, and brought to the public. So you walk down, you walk in Chatham Square in New York, and every few hours you hear new information, new news. So your consciousness of change uh, is uh, alerted uh, immediately. You buy another newspaper, and of course, editors understood they're capitalists. They put their money where they believe their sales are, and they started investing tens of thousands of dollars in speeding news, using special uh, ships, using uh, uh, Pony Expresses and so forth to speed the news. There was a tremendous return on investment in speeding the news. And that is, of course, the background for the significance of the telegraph uh, to uh, the New York press and to the notions of the shrinking distances and the shrinking lengths of time uh, in that period. Thank you very much for that, Professor Blondheim. And for our viewers, the palpable sense of rush is deftly captured in Professor Blondheim's book, uh, News on the Wire. Uh, the unfolding of the speed of the news cycle um, through the various innovations Professor Blondheim just discussed, uh, there's something quite exhilarating even for the reader. So if I may, that's just a reference to, to the work uh, Professor Blondheim has already contributed. Uh, to move on, uh, Director Comor, now to, to just go back to, to, to Moses Beach himself, how critical are Mr. Beach's preoccupations uh, with fast and verifiable news to the Associated Press today? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, in our discussion of, of speed and its origin, um, and speed as a way of doing greater business, but also giving people what they want, uh, timely and new information, the AP still does that. Um, Speed is uh, an ideal, of course. Um, it is not, uh, the, the, however, the primary ideal. You could think of the um, evolution of 
accuracy along with speed as being kind of a joint ideal of the Associated Press. And of course, those those twin ideals are not limited to AP as far as um, uh, the news goes, but the the notion of of pairing accuracy with speed developed over time, um, and I would say that probably that this this sense of you know get it first, but first get it right uh, comes after about 1900. So as the culture within the organization matures. Um, and a, a kind of a sense of how do we want to present ourselves and what indeed are the most important um, uh, goals or what is our, our chief mission, I think you'll find that accuracy kind of climbs past speed. Um, I mean, you can see that uh, in... AP's election coverage. Um, just to give you a, a, an example, in the um, 2020 general election uh, on election night, um, AP was alone with another news organization in calling the race for Biden in Arizona. Now, it turned out that that was the correct call. But in retrospect, it was probably too early to call. And, uh, you know, when you talk, talk to people, yes, they say, yes, um, you know, we, we, that was probably too early. So in other words, even though it turned out to be the right call, um, AP would rather be right <laughs> than first. Uh, so... Um, yes, but it's, you know, speed is certainly never far um, from the, the thinking of journalists, but I think in their training um, and in their, uh, you know, day-to-day -day work, they try very hard to, you know, not to be seduced by the notion of speed because it can, it can lead to problems. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Coma. And... Uh, as in uh, Professor May's case, thank you also for providing some insight to uh, some topics we may pick up uh, in our extended conversations, particularly uh, with your uh, guided experience of knowing how the AP almost writes or thinks on itself. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor May, uh, uh, now a focus question uh, once again for you. Credible news during the Mexican War meant receiving reports uh, from journalists like Jane Storm. Can you share what you know of her connection to the Sun and comment on her influences and biases? Sure. And, and before I do, I just have to uh, uh, add a cultural artifact uh, as kind of a point on uh, Professor Blondheim's uh, remarks a minute ago. Uh, it seems to me that the, the painting uh, by Richard Woodville, The War News from Mexico, comes in so nicely on this. It, it shows uh, uh, a bunch of people in front of a, a building, a wooden, a small wooden building called the American Hotel. And uh, they're on the front steps and they're reading and talking about the, the war news from Mexico. It's just arrived probably by the system that, that Moses Yale Beach set up. Uh, and uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, uh, very interesting historical uh, uh, painting. But anyway, uh, regarding uh, Jane, Jane Storm and her uh, connection with the sun, Jane Storm's had, had a, a very colorful uh, pre-Sun life, you might say. She, she was the daughter of a, a man who became a, a New York congressman. He, he was a lawyer and a, a, a merchant. And uh, they, the family hit some uh, apparently fairly hard economic times, and they got involved in Texas land speculations. And uh, her, uh, her father knew Aaron Burr, uh, who of course had long since killed Alexander Hamilton. And um, he sent uh, Jane, uh, who at the, at the, uh, at the time was uh, unmarried, off to see 
Burr and uh, the uh, the details of the land speculations in Texas uh, are too mind boggling for me to get into on a short program. But she wound up spending much of the 1830s uh, in either Texas uh, or or New York and uh, a large share of it in Texas, uh, where she lived uh, for a while in Matagorda. Uh, she met her future husband, William Casno. Uh, she she got to know many of the leaders of what became the Texas, the, the Republic of Texas and then the state of Texas, uh, President Mirabeau, Bonaparte, Lamar, Sam Houston, uh, all, 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 all sorts of important Texas figures and eventually uh, wrote about them uh, in the uh, magazine, the Democratic Review, uh, and uh, published a, a thing called the Presidents of Texas. And... Um, Anyway, she had this long career in Texas, back and forth, trying. She ta at one point she takes a bunch of German settlers down, trying to settle them on some of her land claims near Waco, Texas. Uh, they refuse to go inland, uh, so that that enterprise fails, uh, and uh, sh she and her future husband play a major role in uh, Texas's uh, early history. He will serve in the Texas legislature and so on and help draft the uh, Texas Constitution. Uh, but to make a long story short, um, when she's pretty much done with the Texas scene, which is where I think she absorbs a lot of her knowledge of Mexico, uh, because Texas at the time, up to the Texas Revolution, uh, is, uh, is a part of, uh, of Mexico. And uh, she she up to the up, what she she moves to New York. She has a little bit of time in the uh, Mediterranean area, reporting for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune, and uh, traveling all over the Mediterranean. And then she comes and settles into a life as a journalist in in New York. And uh, Beach is just part of a whole circle of. Uh, uh, magazines and newspapers that she writes for under various um, uh, pseudonyms. So she she often goes as Montgomery. That way you don't people don't know you're a woman and you might be more likely to get published. Sometimes Cora Montgomery, sometimes Jane Maria McManus, uh, all sorts of different names. Um, uh, Occasionally using her full name, Jane Storm, which was she did marry at one point uh, to a man named Alan Storm. Uh, and, um, and and I might mention along the way that she was named in the Burr divorce suit. Apparently, uh, Burr was caught in a sexual act uh, with her, uh, right? Uh, and, and it was a major issue in Aaron Burr's divorce trial, which was finished up right before Burr died. So that's another funny story. I mean, she is really quite a case. But um, at any rate, she writes for all these different newspapers. And to the best of my knowledge, she, she starts writing for Moses Yale Beach's uh, New York Sun in 1843. And then she gets much more deeply involved with the Sun around the time Texas annexation becomes uh, an important issue uh, in 1845 and uh, writes quite a bit for The Sun, but she's also writing for uh, John O'Sullivan's uh, Democratic uh, magazine and, and, and others, the, the Baltimore Sun. Uh, she, she's a rather remarkable woman and she will keep up her contact with The Sun after the mission with Beach. She will continue writing for it. Uh, she will develop perhaps an even closer relationship with Beach's son, Moses Sperry Beach, because if you read the papers of the Brewster Beach family collection, uh, there, are, there seems, seems to me to be a, a closer collection with, uh, with, with Moses Sperry Beach uh, in the later years uh, of her involvement with the son after uh, Beach gives up the day-to-day -day, uh, editing of the, uh, of, the, of the son to his son. So... Um, and it's, it's all a, a very interesting relationship that, uh, I mean, obviously I could give a lot more details on, on Jane Storm, but I think that's the broad outline of it. Thank you very much. And I might suggest it seems like you may add to your three existing papers on Jane Storm 
It feels like there's still a treasure trove of knowledge. Thank you very much, Professor May. Uh, moving back to, to you, Director Comer, can you comment on, on war coverage and the evolution of the AP? Well, I think it's probably um, no surprise that uh, Beach would have wanted to speed the news of the war in Mexico um, to his readers. There was a great clamor uh, for news of the war. And, um, you know, it, these, these things just came together for him. Um, he understood that there was a delay in the transmission of the news dispatches that arrived across the Gulf of Mexico from Veracruz to Mobile and then onward to Montgomery. That Mobile-Montgomery leg uh, tended to delay uh, the news, probably because um, of the difficulty uh, getting horses or getting, you know, moving across that particular leg. So, you know, in, in hiring a, 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 a rider um, who would get those dispatches from Mobile to Montgomery and then on to the Great Southern Mail coaches, which would take those dispatches to Richmond, which was then the southern terminal of the telegraph. Um, he uh, it was trying to solve a, a very real uh, time problem by uniting several different technologies. Of course, if, as we've discussed, the boat, the horse, and linking them up to the new te technology of the telegraph. So I think uh, the war simply provided the, um, the, the source or the impetus for that information. Um, but the Associated Press um, covers war as it, as it covers any news. So there's, there is no um, mystery as to why the Associated Press uh, sends reporters to war zones and always has because somebody has to go and be, be witness uh, to conflict in order to tell the rest of the world about it. Now, clearly um, over the decades and in the intervening centuries, the technology has gone on changing and um, the standards and protocols for war reporting have also changed. So, um, you know, whereas uh, Vietnam was a war that most journalists who covered it look back on with great wonder at how relatively easy it was to get out to the battlefield. That hasn't always been the case, particularly with the more recent conflicts where journalists are typically embedded, as was the case in Iraq and in the Gulf War. But not to get too um, far afield from our discussion, um, you know, you could write volumes about AP's war coverage, but um, it has always been, um, you know, central and it's always been a very, very expensive part of AP, uh, AP's budget. Um, just for example, in, in Ukraine right now, that's, that's another example. Uh, wars are expensive to cover because you're very concerned about the security of your re reporters. Um, you don't want to tire them out. So you have staff that you have to rotate in and rotate out. I mean, it's a hugely, hugely demanding, but essential part of any any news operation and the AP is no different. Thank you very much, uh, Director Comer. And uh, once again, there are some fascinating points you raise that I hope we might uh, have an opportunity to discuss in our follow-up. Thank you once again. Uh, Professor Blondheim, can, can you comment on the social, economic and political forces that Mr. Beach leveraged? So here, I think of paper processing, 
banking, editorial roles, uh, the post office, and so on. Uh, yes, he was a one-man empire of communications in many ways. If I may, before turning back to uh, Moses Beach, comment on two things that uh, uh, Valerie raised. Uh, one is accuracy. And uh, of course, we must not forget that the AP, given telegraphic technology, which is a broadcast technology, basically, the way the AP used it, right? Uh, it's like this great uh, hourglass of news coming in, funneling into New York headquarters from all over the country, being sifted, edited, and then broadcast in one writing to every nook and corner in the United States. To uh, every newspaper gets its news in one writing from the Associated Press. Obviously, the more accurate you are at the source, the, the impact on accuracy throughout the country is tremendous. Let's add to that that the AP throughout most of it, uh, at least the 19th century, uh, was a monopoly. So it did have the luxury of sufficient time because it had no competitors uh, to be accurate. And I think that's a wonderful gift that uh, we got from uh, the more problematic aspects of being a monopoly of knowledge uh, in the 19th century. Uh, wars, the Civil War, the big 19th century war, uh, um, the AP had very little expenses in covering it. In fact, it did much less in the field than any of its member newspapers or most large newspapers in the United States. Because it was a monopoly, it got the infor direct information from the government. Lincoln lived in the telegraph office during the Civil War, uh, and uh, the, the information about the war coming through the wires of the field telegraph, the army telegraph, the military telegraph, to Washington were concentrated in Washington. Uh, the unions gave its authoritative news to the Associated Press to be spread throughout the United States. Hence, the Gettysburg Address goes out, uh, uh, a court on, uh, is given immediately to uh, the Associated Press for spreading throughout the country. So uh, this is a monopoly that uh, has a very uh, close relationship with the administration. It's in fact, Lincoln didn't even go to the trouble of establishing an administration newspaper, as was common before him. He had the Associated Press. Now, part of the beauty of it is no one realized this. Uh, AP uh, reports were always uh, anonymous. They didn't carry uh, a dateline or, or the name of the correspondent. Uh, this was, uh, Professor May, this was car, car, uh, pretty current with uh, reporters, unlike correspondents. Uh, and there you have the problem of pseudonyms if the correspondent had happened to be a woman. Uh, but uh, the news spread throughout the, the, the Union. No one knew exactly where they came from. And Lincoln could just impress the first news on the nation the way he wanted. Therefore, the Associated Press, that was a tremendous bane. Of course, in, different, in other wars, it was more difficult. And one additional problem, most of the wars America participated in after the Civil War uh, were held abroad. And... Uh, the issue of secrecy and the freedom of the press was not a great issue when you're reporting from Europe and the news it, it will take uh, it, the news is happening very far away from the battlefield and there is a significant delay. Consider even in Vietnam, uh, a major source were uh, videos being sent from uh, from there. So uh, there's uh, there's a complexity to this uh, news reporting and AP tries tried to to do its best and most effective in different uh, mixes of media uh, that we spoke of. Uh, uh, what was your question again, Rian? Uh, I went uh, on and on in, comment, in response to, uh, to, to... To some extent, you, you have answered part of my question. Thank you, uh, Prof. Blondheim. It was, uh, to repeat, it was just uh, asking any commentary you might have had on the, the social, economic, and political forces that Moses Y. Beach uh, leveraged uh, in his time. And to some extent, I felt you touched upon that, but uh, if you'd like to elaborate, please uh, go ahead. I, I think we have to uh, think of the political aspect 
uh, as pretty separate. The Penny Press uh, is given credit for inaugurating a, a, a press that is not politically uh, influenced by the establishment of uh, the, a kind of a free press. Uh, to an extent, it is correct. However, pre the the press prior to the Penny Press was also pretty independent uh, in the sense that uh, editors, or let's put it differently, the Penny Press, the some less than others, but uh, was usually politically opinionated. It's, but it wasn't funded by the party. It was private enterprise, and you could always hear some refreshing uh, new ideas coming from the press. And the deep sense of public opinion of the 19th century, which is not as today kind of feedback, uh, how many people support or not support. It was opinions coming from the bottom up, percolating up from the people uh, to government, to administrations, to elites. And in that sense, the uh, penny press was truly a, a medium of public opinion, uh, bringing open, fresh ideas to the marketplace of ideas, and then they funneled up into the political debate. Economically, the role of Beach and the Penny Press and this collaboration around the Telegraph, which is the Associated Press, created perhaps the most significant democratiz democratization of markets in American history. So we're already in the Jacksonian period tending towards a market economy, eh, but insiders had advantage eh, in acquiring and holding and working on the basis of inside information. People who had networks of correspondence were the first, got letters from their colleagues and were the first to know the economic conditions and act accordingly in the markets. So the press always came in second. If you based your information on what came in the newspaper, this is after all the traders already speculated in the market, you had nothing to, to, to gain. Once the telegraph, became, which was the fastest means of communication. And given New York's incorporation law, they were given priority to, to spread financial news. The first news that anyone got in America were from the Associated Press, news from Europe, news from the uh, news from the markets. So there was a tremendous, given the Associated Press serving the public and not insiders, uh, it was a tremendous force of leveling opportunities and uh, in America, and that created the possibility of an open market economy in which people could be mobile, like mobile Moses Giel Beach was. He moved up very fast, became very wealthy, and wrote about these wealthy people of America, seeing that new money and old money could reach the same heights in a very, very short period of time. So that's about politics, that's about economics, and that's about Moses Giel Beach. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. A somewhat more general question for all, and perhaps uh, this, this question uh, could have some relevance to anyone entering the academe, entering archival work, entering journalism, uh, entering the study of history. Can each of you comment on, on the challenges and importance of primary sources? And the irony that Mr. Beach's date of birth is inaccurately recorded in most references because it was reported in his New York Times obituary incorrectly. Okay, I, I have a wonderful anecdote about this, uh, which came from uh, my interaction with uh, Valerie Comor. Uh, I knew about the, uh, the, the Moses Beach Memorandum, which is our main piece of evidence for establishing the uh, date of the Associated Press and the process of its establishment. Uh, my colleague, uh, as a student uh, in grad school, Steve Jaffe, w worked on the Brewster Beach paper. He was working on New York ju journalism and knew I was working on the wire services. Uh, he found this document in the Brewster Beach papers. I wrote an article, I think 50 pages, Valerie. You, you, we sh I shared it with you, dating the Associated Press based on the Beach Memorandum. A main aspect feature of that paper, of that article, was dating the Beach Memorandum. When was it written? And uh, and I gave this lecture with this great discovery of concluding when the Beach Memorandum was authored. And Valerie, like said, took it nonchalantly. She said, uh, yeah, of course. 
Turns out, Steve Jaffe gave me a copy of the Beach Memorandum that he Xerox. Valerie had the full document, and the dating, the date of writing the document was on the verso, was on the back of that page, which I had to write 50 pages and work for I don't know how long on trying to figure out when the document was written. Valerie had the document, and she knew immediately. She knew it from the word go. That document, you, you turn it over, and it says June slash 72, death of Bennett. So immediately you kind of picture the son of Moses Yale Beach, Moses Sperry Beach, who authored this little uh, recollection of the founding of the Associated Press. And you realize that he probably sat down after the death of the son's great rival editor, James Gordon Bennett, in June of 1872, to uh, set the record straight uh, or to, fi you know, to fix permanently his understanding of his father's contribution, which that memorandum does very, very precisely. Um, and so that is that is something that um, the archivist uh, having, you know, having the physical paper has the luxury to do, uh, to, to handle the physical item and to make that physical item available to historians like you both to study and, 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 and increase the sum of, of our, of our understanding. Um, but it is, you know, so that, that little, um, that little story is repeated probably thousands of times, um, you know, day in and day out as we struggle to either make out handwriting that is not clear or make out, uh, a, a a scan on, on microfilm that has been poorly photographed so that an A looks like an E or a C. Um, uh, meanwhile, you're going blind trying to figure out what letter it really is. Um, and then just people make mistakes. Um, journalists make mistakes. Uh, diarists, correspondents, um, you know, people are human, and so they uh, remember incorrectly, or they make things up as they go along to cover ignorance, uh, or they hazard guesses. So there really is, there, there's absolutely uh, no surprise, from this archivist anyway, that a, a date of birth might have gotten off by a week. Um, it, it's it, it, you know, I can think of many, many reasons why that would have happened. And it's really funny that Menachem tells that story because when I read the list of questions and saw that, I thought, hmm, we could tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> With, uh, yeah, excuse me, I'll put Professor May, go ahead. I was I was going to say that I could tell it too because uh, when <laughs> first first of all all historians um, if they're smart I think and this is certainly advice I'd give to grad students uh, find a topic to study where there are good primary sources to give you an example when I was trying to figure out what to do after my first book my first book came out of my doctoral dissertation I had a topic that had all been mapped out in grad school but but now I had to find something on my own. And I decided I wanted to write another book that had something to do with American expansion. And uh, I got one of the topics that most intrigues me is these filibusters who were American private citizens who formed military expeditions to conquer foreign countries uh, in the period before the Civil War. And uh, one of those filibusters conquered Nicaragua. His name was William Walker. Um, and um, it's a fascinating story, but I had already seen the most of the Walker primary sources, that is to say letters, and you always hope for diaries, but they, they're often not there. Uh, and uh, they were pretty dull and bland, and uh, they were very businesslike. He might say in a letter to one of his associates when planning an expedition to Nicaragua, 
make sure you've got the boat ready to go at seven o'clock, Walker, you know, and, and they'd be short, cryptic sentences, didn't tell much of his life, his, his feelings, his family, anything like that. And so I, I just decided, uh, what could I add to the established record? Not much. Um, so I, uh, I kept looking and I was probing around the Historical Society of Pennsylvania and uh, I found a letter collection from another uh, prospective filibuster uh, topic, uh, John Quitman, who was, uh, I, I knew he was the Mexican war hero who uh, led U.S. troops into Mexico City during the, the U.S.-Mexican War. I knew he had been uh, Mississippi's leading secessionist. But what I didn't know uh, was that there was this really wonderful collection of his private letters to his son at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So I decided, oh, I think I'll go with this. And later on, I found some diary fragments and things like that. And there were, it turns out, there were equipment collections all over the United States. And uh, so I had probably 10, 20 times as many primary sources. Uh, and, and I wrote a 400 page book. I don't know what I could have said that much new about William Walker. Uh, and um, uh, that, that's one thing. So I think primary sources are essential to writing good histories. And uh, it, it also helps differentiate uh, many popular histories or commercial histories, we might say, which reevaluate what past historians have written to come up with new interpretations and what uh, important uh, new, new work is. Uh, but uh, second of all, in the case of Quitman, uh, here's where the link comes in with the beach story. Uh, I was trying to figure out when Quitman was born. And... Um, it turns out there's this prior two volume synthesis. It's got some of his letters. It's part biography, it's partly the study of Mississippi history by J.F.H. Claiborne, who was one of his close friends. So he had written before the Civil War a book about John Quitman, uh, who died uh, shortly before the Civil War. And uh, Claiborne says very carefully, and this is by one of Quitman's own friends, that Quitman was born in 1798. So when I wrote my first publication on Quitman, which was just an article, I had the wrong birthday. Mm -hmm. And um, um, luckily, in doing research on him before I got the book done, I traveled to Rhinebeck, New York, which was his birthplace. And uh, my family and I went probing around reading cemetery inscriptions. And we found the Quitman family plot. And there on the gravestone, I found that John Quitman mm -hmm. was born a year later. In 1799. So luckily, I, I got that information at least in time uh, for my book. We're all embarrassed by errors in books, and uh, most books have uh, at least one or two errors somewhere in them, and, and we try to minimize them. Uh, and uh, so uh, that, that's, uh, that's definitely a link. And, and what I would add to the, uh, to the reflections here are that, uh, that, that these days, we have so many ways to check things. Uh, you can join Ancestry.com and, and get all sorts of census material without even going to the libraries and reading the microfilm reels and that kind of thing. Uh, it was much harder years ago uh, when I was uh, starting out as a historian. There are wonderful encyclopedias uh, today of all sorts that are easy reference. Um, and uh, of course, the web and Google help. And, and yes, there's a lot of misinformation on the web, but uh, there are so many sources that a, a careful uh, scholar can, you know, start checking things against each other. Uh, Google Books can help out in many cases. Uh, Internet Archives, another web source. There are just so many ways to get the story uh, straight today. So that's a roundabout way of uh, saying, yes, primary sources are essential. The primary sources are tricky, and uh, if, if you want to get the story right, you've got to try your best to be meticulous. Thank you very much, Professor May. Um, Director Komov, uh, Professor Blondheim, uh, would you still like to add something to, to this particular question that seems to be inviting re reflections? Uh, first of all, I mean, Professor May's final po point raises really some significant concerns. Uh, how will the historians of the future document our own era. Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm just throwing that out, but I, we can, you know, spend uh, the three of us, the four of us, a uh, tremendous amount of time on, you know, pondering this issue, which is there, 
which leads me to more very quick AP stories or AP history stories. One is of that vein. Uh, maybe Valerie can help me out with the story, but uh, I was working on, uh, I was very generously granted uh, uh, permission to use AP, the AP president, president's letter books that were at AP headquarters at, at the time, sorry, at the Western Union president's letter books, which were located in Upper Saddle River where uh, Western Union's headquarters were, and uh, the corporate secretary was very generous. I, I spent two or three weeks there at an office, and then I had to come back because there were some things I really had to look up after processing the information. And she let, she they used these files, these president's letter books, as live documents because there were issues of real estate, rights of way underground, and so on for telegraph wires that were still relevant. So they were in this kind of safe the size of the room I'm sitting in, uh, and she arranged the Margaret Jasko, the uh, Western Union corporate secretary at the time, arranged a small table for me in the in the safe, mm -hmm. and she pointed out that above my head was this giant manila envelope, and she said, oh, it, it was full of seals. It was It was sealed by the Supreme Court. These were all the telegrams coming in and out of Dallas, Texas, in I think the week or the month before and after uh, Kennedy's, the Kennedy assassination. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Warren Committee didn't, uh, Western Union wouldn't hand in the telegrams because it said it was you know, private uh, correspondence and the right of privacy. And the commission wanted the documents to find the, the mur Kennedy's murderer. Uh, and the, it was decided not to allow the, the reading of the telegrams, but that Western Union had the schedule of destroying documents because it could keep all co copies of all telegrams forever. Uh, so they would, the documents would be preserved, but not perused, and they would be in the custody of Western Union's corporate secretary. So there I was sitting alone in the safe, with the answer to the question, who assassinated Kennedy right above my head? <laughs> now, I don't know what ever happened to those documents. I'm still curious, but since I'm a 19th century historian and a 20th century, I guess someone else is concerned with that. That's one IP story. Uh, another one uh, actually draws the arrow in the opposite direction. Uh, I'm, I, I was working on the bogus proclamation uh, in, in the Civil War, which was the incident that's significant because it was the greatest threat on freedom uh, of uh, the press and the freedom of speech in America during the war, Lincoln actually ordered closure of two New York newspapers in the only time in his career. He was extremely liberal. Uh, and I built a theory about what happened there when clearly it, it was a New York hoax. Someone tried to make money fast and uh, said there was a union debacle and uh, expected the prices of gold, gold to go up, and this was a fabrication in New York. But Lincoln insisted that it originated, uh, the fabrication, the hoax, it, it originated in Washington. And my theory was that he actually wrote a proclamation to that effect, uh, but didn't issue it yet. And someone he suspected found, went into his office, found this document and publicized it without authorization. So this is real treason. Uh, and the theory bothered remained, but I couldn't prove it. And I started looking in all, every possible Lincoln uh, archive, any archive that had any documents by Lincoln. And ultimately, I found it in a tiny collection in Indiana. I think they had five Lincoln original uh, autograph letters in which Lincoln actually wrote that same night of the bogus proclamation in order to uh, call to duty uh, 300,000 men, which... In, indicated failure in the war. So uh, that that's sometimes you can go the opposite way and actually research uh, it can try to establish something that but then only real uh, authentic documents can uh, prove it can authenticate it. Uh, again, the question is, what do we do today tomorrow in this era of fleeting bits and bytes and uh, information mm -hmm. transpiring into space? Thank you very much. Professor Blondin, and in some way, not for the first time, uh, you illuminate uh, an aspect of the next question um, I'm, I'm going to raise. During America's recent midterm elections, in fact, just earlier this month, the world heard several times 
the AP has called the winner, or we are waiting for the AP to call the winner. So the significance of the AP is enough to establish its founder, Moses Beach, as an important historical figure. But there is much more to this man and his pursuit of an elusive legacy. So to Professor May, I, I asked, well, let me frame it this way. We're always catching up with history. So is there a particular insight you have now that, uh, that you have spent some time thinking about Moses Yale Beach? Um, so do you have a particular insight you have now um, about how he may have wanted to influence his world, his time? I, th I think uh, probably what strikes me the most is how representative he was of a, of a kind of almost a consensus feeling among many of the New York newspapermen, especially O'Sullivan, who we worked with mm -hmm. quite a bit, and yet, yet they were rivals. Uh, and uh, O'Sullivan claimed that uh, Beach's circulation wasn't as high as Beach claimed it was and, and, and so on. So there was a real rivalry between them, but they both uh, seemed to have a real sensitivity uh, that America had to be the, uh, a country for the working people and that they had a role in fulfilling that. It was a, it was a mission that, that Jane Casneau joined in, in many of her columns for both of them. Uh, and uh, that uh, the country had to grow and it had to prosper and that it had to spread Republican institutions. Uh, in this sense, they were descendants of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, neither of their newspapers were supposedly partisan, and yet they really were democratic mouthpieces, uh, despite their independence. And I think that Professor Blondheim got, got at that a, a little bit in his comments uh, that uh, you know, you have, uh, in, in those days, you had subsid subsidizing going on with a lot of the press, and uh, they got printing contracts, for instance, they got a lot of their money that way. Uh, but uh, Beach and O'Sullivan and others depended on daily, you know, daily sales often on the streets. And, and so there was real democratic impulse that they were trying to spread throughout the continent, uh, maybe extended to Latin America. Uh, and uh, I, I think they shared this. And they also shared, I think, a, a kind of weakness on the slavery question. That is to say, neither of them and uh, many Democratic newsmen uh, wanted to see the, the, the slavery question ruin the uh, republic for uh, all, all whites, uh, including middling whites, working people, and so on that they were trying to promote. And uh, so they tended to suppress the, uh, the slavery issue as much as they could. Uh, when Jane Casneau wrote on Texas, uh, she promoted the idea of a, uh, a transsectional, that is Robert J. Walker, who uh, was, was really a, a northerner, became a Mississippian. And uh, then when, you know, he, 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 he crossed both, both sections and he promoted this theory of the safety valve that if you have, uh, Texas, it'll be a safety valve for America's slavery question, that, that slavery will gradually siphon off from the southern states into Texas and then into Latin America, and it can all be resolved without a, without a war and without disunion. And so I think that was the primary uh, goal of both uh, Beach and O'Sullivan and others in their circle. And uh, the, the problem is it, it sends a mixed message to today because um, uh, I, I'm struck in particular by an editorial that I read of Beach's, it was, it was I, I think, labeled, uh, dated 1847, in, in which he essentially said that um, slavery was abhorrent. Those were his words. Uh, and uh, but he was writing as, as a correspondent from New Orleans. He was on his way back from his Mexican mission. And uh, he said it's abhorrent. And then he goes on in, in the next sentence and talks about the cleanliness of the New Orleans uh, slave pen or slave jail. And, uh, and, and so there's, there's kind of an ambigu ambiguity there. Uh, so so ju just to summarize one more time the point, uh, I think they were trying to promote uh, a greater republic and greater democracy uh, for American whites and to uh, expand it while also warding off the threat of civil war over the issue of slavery. Thank you very much, Professor May. Professor Blondheim, 
As you reflect on the motivations that changed journalism in the 19th century, are there any lessons for today? A major tension that I think we face and have been facing since uh, the mid 19th century uh, is between our hope for cohesiveness, having a general public agenda that can unite uh, people in New York on, in the first uh, phase and then all Americans and then all people of the world and so forth. We're looking for uh, some kind of unity, for closeness, for dependence, for interdependence, for being on the same page with the people around us in our neighborhood, in our city, in our country, uh, in the world. Uh, and when we look back at things that pioneers like Moses Yale Beach accomplished, uh, it's tremendous and it's gratifying having people who previously could not afford to buy newspapers or wouldn't go to the trouble because it wasn't interesting enough, uh, being part and sharing the pulse and the feelings and the events, and uh, 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 you know, this experience of manifest destiny, this idea is spread uh, by O'Sullivan through, uh, right, that uh, the Professor Maynard uh, was speaking about. Uh, so this unity, this cohesion, this one nation with differences, but that can be debated and art can be debated in the public sphere, uh, we long for it in a sense, in this, especially in this age of fake news, of uh, tweets and posts and, and disinformation and horrible kinds of uh, content and materials that, that are spread and you don't know when many people trust or they sh are not trustworthy. Uh, the, the responsibility of people like Beach, uh, as citizens, as uh, mass media owners, uh, is something we, in a sense, miss. We long for it. But there is the other side of the tremendous power which these people uh, they acquired. I mean, they could determine almost the fate of American participation in uh, the Spanish-American War, because there was one narrow conduit that, that Valerie described, going from ship to a Pony Express to telegraph wire. There was one version of the truth. There was one version of the world. And that is scary, a monopoly of knowledge. So I, I think we live this tension between our wish to be informed, to be part of the public, of having this combination of news, of information and people, and having all of us share the same information environment. We long for that, but then we we really want the diversity. We want this Uncle Tom's cabin coming out of nowhere and completely transforming America. Uh, so I, I think in many ways, these uh, these tensions remain in uh, throughout the ages. And Moses E. L. Beach was like the peak, the epitome of one movement towards, ma towards massification, towards participation towards uh, a, a knowledgeable electorate uh, and and one America from all its uniting from all its parts. And that's what the AP did. It was the first national non-government organization in America. Uh, so that's a tremendous accomplishment on the one hand, but we, sh we, uh, we should be aware of its downside too. Thank you very much, Professor Blondheim. Shall I pause in case Director Como and uh, Professor May would like to come in on that? I just wanted to pick up on uh, the the notion of the preservation um, of of this uh, of this news that um, Professor Blondheim and Professor May have already described um, in terms of the uh, the challenges uh, that the the archival community faces um, on the one hand. Uh, to preserve uh, the journalism that um, and, and the uh, administration of that journalism, to preserve the record of all that, but also, of course, that we preserve um, the the writing of news at all. Uh, that that we continue to try to um, work to excuse me. Um, well, I'll let that go. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know the question of of the educated citizenry, uh, the, the question of being able to read 
to respond, to fulfill our roles as citizen uh, by becoming informed um, uh, readers of, of the news. And, uh, you know, all of, all of that has been really, is now up for grabs, I think, in the culture. And so the work of preservation um, and education, I think, go hand in hand. Yeah, and I'll just uh, add that um... I, I, I'm struck by the wisdom of your comments, both of your comments, and uh, that uh, we're in an age, you know, it, it's very funny looking back on the antebellum period, the period before the Civil War, when there's so many things to despise. Um, labor unions were suppressed, indigenous people were uh, warred on and uh, discriminated against and had their lands taken away and they weren't considered citizens. Uh, we were, um, we, we attacked foreign nations. Uh, really the Mexican war was 90%, uh, I think, uh, the US's fault. Uh, and we were looking for, ter for new territory. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of things and then, then you tack onto it uh, enslavement throughout uh, much of the country and uh, women's rights were just beginning to get talked about and pushed but obviously had a long ways uh, to go before women's suffrage and things like that so you can go on and on like that but for all the bad things you did have an expanding news media and uh, it went up the number of daily newspapers I think went up from about 25 daily newspapers early in the century and it's up to 250 or 300, I think, by around the time of the Civil War. And at any rate, uh, citizens could have access to news locally. Uh, many cities and towns had newspapers representing both parties. And, um, and we were getting to a point where we're getting even some of our best newspapers are either going online, uh, they're getting too expensive for poor people to buy, uh, declining circulations. The New York Times is obviously a, 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 a paper that's bucked that trend. But uh, we, we have to, I think, uh, be very wary of a society without a, a truly uh, enlightened press where uh, a, a extremists of, of any persuasion can uh, seize far more uh, believers online, you know, with podcasts and, and so on, like, uh, and uh, where people aren't getting balanced news. And, uh, and the Associated Press throughout its long history has, I think, uh, striven to promote balanced news. And uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about where we're heading on all this. Thank you. Uh, it, it's quite profound to, to hear um, what each of you are sharing, and, and, and in some cases, as in uh, um, the, the friendship and, and uh, the collegial history between uh, Director Coman and Professor Blondheim, uh, it's even more fascinating to hear uh, how they've encountered the same topics, some of the same works uh, in their respective fields, um, and, and to, to hear your, 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 your sharing of your overview of that, uh, Professor May. So firstly, on, on that, um, I'm grateful to all three of you. And I'm, I'm winding the discussion down now. And we, we plan to follow up with, with you um, to have a somewhat more free-range conversation about Moses Beach and his time and ours. But for now, firstly, we are very, very grateful uh, to the generosity of your time and sharing of your experience. And I would like to close with words from Mr. Beach. And I'm wondering if I may impress upon Director Coma to, to help us with that. So, um, Director Coma, is there something in the AP archive, uh, in his own words, in Moses Beach's own words, that can give us insight into his contribution to the world? Well, to be completely truthful, uh, there is nothing in the papers of um, Mr. Beach that uh, quote him uh, directly so we are we are somewhat at a loss because we don't have, I mean, when you consider uh, that he lived from 1800 to 1868, um, but nothing survives 
And that's the key word, that nothing survives in his hand, mm -hmm. which is the only place we would find anything, anything that he had written. Uh, so the only thing we have are the recollections of his son, Moses Sperry Beach. But as you as you can imagine, that's that's indirect. Um, so we don't we don't know. We have a beautiful oil portrait of Moses Yale Beach, uh, which was probably done sometime while he was at the New York Sun between you know 1835 and 1848. He is it, probably about 40 years old or 50 years old. He's in the pink of health. Uh, he looks very, very pleased with himself, very successful, um, and sort of riding the wave of destiny and you know to me that that's the closest thing to speech that mm. that i find um as i said apart from the re recollections of his family that portrait speaks to me uh every time i see it perhaps i may interject that a picture can speak of a thousand lost words perhaps mm -hmm. just in this instance although uh, somewhat uh Cryptically, my station manager is hinting that something may have been found. Uh, this will be rolled in, but once again, my thank you to all three of you for your time and for this most illuminating conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure and joy and privilege to hear your insights, uh, your, your shared wisdoms, and to also hear how you engage among one another about these very valuable and really, in fact, timeless topics. So thank you very much. Thank Moses you. Yale Beach, in his own words. In the entry from Wealth and the Biography of the Wealthy Citizens of the City of New York, which is described as being an alphabetical arrangement of the names of the most prominent capitalist whose wealth is estimated at $100,000 and upwards. He is approximately age 42 at the time of this entry, which is rather hyperbolic in that the references to Elihu Yale also are hyperbolic. A descendant of Puritans who turned Episcopalian, he was not really the founder of Yale College. He was a benefactor. And these hyperboles are also in Moses Yale Beach's description of himself. In his own words, Moses Yale Beach. Moses Y. Beach was born in Wallingford, Connecticut, his grandfather and father being the first settlers and largest landholders in that section. He is a connection on his mother's side of Elihu Yale, founder of Yale College and for many years governor of East India. At an early age, he apprenticed to the cabinet making business in Hartford, Connecticut, where by overwork and working nights, managed to save by the time he had attained his 18th year, $400, with which he purchased the remainder of his time and commenced business on his own account in Massachusetts. Soon after, he married and has since then passed through the rough and varied scenes of business life. After commencement of the Sun newspaper, he purchased Mr. Wisner's interest, being one half, paying for the experiment, $5,200. As soon as he found this to be a safe and permanent business, he bought out his partner, for which he paid $19,900. From this point, his star, or rather, sum, has been steadily in the ascendant, and now we find him the publisher of the most extensively circulated paper upon the globe and the principal stockholder in four banks, all in good standing and prosperous, besides doing under his own name large amounts of banking. For assistance in his unparalleled business, he has the service of five sons, brought up in active life under his own eye, and who may yet prove chips off the old block.